Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please click the link in the description and click the join button below for more details. My name is Saba, and today we are continuing to investigate financial contagion tests, and we are finalizing our series of four videos with the investigation of Freya McKibben and Xiao co-volatility contagion test. It is a higher moment co-movement test that seeks to evaluate whether variances of um, two assets of interest um, perform differently in crisis times and non-crisis times. Is there an increased or reduced link or co-movement between variances of two assets subject to increased uncertainty? And we'll investigate our application of the co-volatility test based on stock and bond returns in the US from the year end 2018 until year end 2020. And our crisis period would be associated with the 11th of March 2020 WHO global pandemic announcement. So let's calculate daily stock returns and bond returns first, calculating across both assets and across the entire sample period. Then we can calculate crisis specific and non-crisis specific volatilities of both assets alongside the means as well. We'll need that for our higher moments calculation. So we do st sample standard deviation for uh, stocks. We select column D and go all the way until we see our crisis period starting. Again, row 301 is when uh, the announcement um, is due to happen next day, 11th of March, 2020. We can do it for bonds the same way by dragging the cross. And for the crisis period, we need to go from the crisis announcement, which is the 11th of March, until the very end, which is row 507. Let's remember it because it will make application of further formulas much easier and less bulky. We can see that the volatility of stocks has increased quite a bit, and this would be quite important for the identification of the market of contagion origin. Just as in the previous tests, we need to make sure that we select one market where we believe contagion originates. Again, uh, this can have theoretical reasons, but if you have got uh, little to no um, theoretical presumption to believe one market is the contagion uh, of origin, we would just select the market where volatility increases the most. And that's what the stock market is in this case. Now for the uh, period and asset class specific means, we can copy this function, plug it in, and calculate the averages, just changing the function from the standard deviation function to the average function, quite naturally. Now we can calculate the sample size, counting uh, either of the returns uh, across the sample period of question. So from D3 to D301, that's the sample size of the non-crisis period, and counting from D302 to D507, would be the sample size for the crisis period. We see that we've got 299 non-crisis observations and 206 crisis period observations. Now we can calculate simple unadjusted correlations. We can take it at face value for the non-crisis period, but just as in Forbes and Rigobin, Fry et al. and the Kirkcurtis' test from the same paper, we'll need to perform the heteroscedasticity adjustment of the uh, crisis period correlation uh, to more precisely evaluate the standard errors of our test for co-volatility, as well as co-volatilities themselves. So for the non-crisis correlation, we input the corel function and input two arrays for the non-crisis uh, sample. And for crisis correlation, we do exactly the same, but start at row 302 and end at row 507. We can see that uh, at face value, the correlation in crisis has increased by quite a bit from less than 0 0.01 to higher than 0 0.04, quite substantial if you think about it. However, we'll also need to adjust it. Uh, adjusting it for heteroscedasticity involves dividing the unadjusted correlation coefficient by the square root of one plus, 
the increase in variance in the market of origin subject to increased uncertainty. So variance of stocks in crisis minus variance of stocks not in crisis divided by variance of stocks not in crisis. The ask has to be multiplied by one minus the unadjusted uh, crisis correlation squared. And that produces an adjusted correlation coefficient that's almost twice as lower as the unadjusted uh, correlation coefficient. For the non-crisis correlation, we can simply refer to the calculation we've made recently. And now, to calculate co-volatility, we can simply translate this function into the language of Excel. Again, this uh, seeks to evaluate the product of uh, variances across uh, the entire sample period and find the average of them, and then adjust it by a factor of 1 plus 2 correlation squared. Here is where the uh, hydroscedisticity adjustment also comes in handy, because that will be uh, crucial for estimating co-volatility in crisis times. So again, the average of our um, stock returns across the non-crisis period minus the stock-specific mean in the non-crisis period squared divided by stock-specific volatility uh, in the non-crisis period squared. And then we repeat it for bonds. Bond-specific returns in the non-crisis period minus bond-specific average in the non-crisis period squared divided by bond-specific volatility in the non-crisis period squared. That uh, concludes the uh, summation function. 1 over t is taken into account in the average operator here, and we subtract 1 plus 2 times the non-crisis correlation uh, denoted here squared. And that calculates our non-crisis co-volatility. It's positive, meaning that increases in volatility of stocks lead to an increase of volatility in bonds and uh, vice versa. There is co-movement in volatilities or variances of these two asset classes, even in non-crisis times. Does it increase or reduce subject to crisis? Well, let's have a look. In this case, we can just drag it down, refer to the correct adjusted correlation formula, and adjust the sample sizes for the crisis period sample from row 302 to row 507. And that's the only thing that we need to change as our means and standard deviations have changed automatically as we drag the function down. We can see that the co-volatility has reduced quite a bit, meaning that in times of crisis, there's rust variance between stock and bond markets in the United States. Let's test how substantial this reduction in co-volatility is, and for that we need to use a chi-squared statistic, a chi-squared test with one degrees of freedom. So for the chi-squared statistic, we first need to calculate the difference between co-volatility uh, in crisis and non-crisis times, divided by the standard error term, which is the square root of four times the adjusted crisis correlation to the fourth power, plus 16 times the adjusted crisis time correlation squared plus four. That has to be divided by the crisis sample size, which is 206, plus the uh, error term relevant for the non-crisis times. Here we can use four times non-crisis correlation to the power of 4, plus 16 times the non-crisis correlation squared, plus 4, and divided by the non-crisis sample size. Then we have to square the entire expression, giving us a chi-squared statistic of 75.34, and the p-value can be retrieved using the right-tailed chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom. And that uh, generates a very small p-value, uh, meaning that the reduction in co-volatility in times of crisis is substantial, meaning that bonds and stocks are less responsive to volatilities of each other when there is increased uncertainty. That can be a positive sign, meaning that bonds can be treated as safe havens during uh, uncertainty periods. However, given that this effect is uh, two-directional, uh, there is uh, little to be said about uh, which asset is actually a safe haven from the innovations in volatility uh, in the other, bonds or stocks. What is also a quite uh, important limitation of uh, any contagion test of this sort is absence of omitted variable bias. There might be some other variable, let's say commodity indices or international stock market indices, that could um, be at play here and uh, that we cannot uh, rule out as this model, again, assumes 
absence of omitted variable bias. In this regard, you could theoretically perform your um, contagion analysis on not returns, but residuals from regressing your uh, returns onto all other asset classes that might be impactful. Uh, this is uh, something that can be done, although it be makes calculations a little bit bulkier, but not uh, much uh, different in the sense of the logic of the implementation. And that's all there is for uh, prevalent tests for financial contagion based on correlation, co-skewness, co courtesies and co-volatility. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider support us on Patreon. Thank you very much. And stay tuned.